Good morning, everyone. And it's a little warmer out today, but it's still been a wonderful weather week, and I've hopefully you've been able to get out and enjoy that. Um, it is wonderful to worship with you today. Um, and uh, just a little heads up, if this is the only angle on camera that you see for the entire service, if you're on the live stream side, uh, it's going to be the only angle you see because we are missing Ethan and Elliot today. So we are, are Ethan and Rick today, and Elliot's running sound, uh, but it is more than job than one person can do to run sound and change the cameras and do the PowerPoint and, and, and. So, um, so we get what we get today. Um, I did get my laptop back, so that is wonderful, but we can't do PowerPoints because, well, we can't run them. So. But everything will be fine. We will still worship and honor God uh, today. So we are going to start with announcements, so Joan will bring that to us, and then uh, she will lead us in our call to worship. Good morning. So for our announcements... If you have joys or concerns, please send them to Pastor Scott uh, via email or text, and you can also call our prayer chain. Uh, just a reminder again that our Sunday school is meeting at 9 a.m. All are welcome, so please, please join in. Uh, the youth group will be meeting tonight uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, let's see. Oh, if you are not on the email distribution list that Pastor Scott sends out, uh, please contact him. And I believe, I don't know if we have it in the, yes, his email is listed in the bulletin. Uh, lastly, if you would like to be part of the tech team, your help would be greatly appreciated. Uh, please see Pastor Scott, Rick, or Ethan. As Pastor Scott said, neither Rick or Ethan are here today, so we could really use additional help on the, the technical side of things. Um, it's not that hard. <laughs> as an excuse, because I see all of you getting out your phones and doing things. You get on the computer for the internet. I know some of you email. So if you have the ability to use this finger or any of the other nine fingers, you can do this. Okay, um, and again, just a reminder, we are still collecting donations, both personal care items as well as the eye, eyewear, and those bins are now in the office supply room, which is just down the hall off the main, uh, main room. And then lastly, the flowers today uh, are given by Pastor Scott um, for Carla, which it's her birthday. She was 29 for a while, now it's the anniversary of her 29th. We don't see how many anniversaries, uh, but she is young and beautiful, and that's enough, right? <laughs> uh, are there any other announcements for the good of the church? All right, if not, then please stand and we'll have our call to worship. In the beginning was the word with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Hymn number 121, and since we don't have PowerPoints, that means you have to pick up these blue books. I know some of you haven't used them for a while, and we're going to turn to 121, little numbers on the top. Um, and um, some of you may not be familiar with this song, so Bonnie's going to play through it once, and then we're going to join in singing all four verses after Bonnie plays through it the first time. Thank you. 
around you and maybe find a face you haven't seen for a while and say hello.
back up. Elliot will get my mic going, right? You got my mic on? All right. So um, as we come to uh, our times of joy and concerns, uh, Laura wants to thank everybody for all the prayers for her son. Um, he went in for hernia surgery, found out he had double hernia, and they, they got him straightened out, uh, and things uh, are going well. Um, uh, uh, we want to uh, 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 had a good joy, had a great visit with uh, Sylvia this week. She enjoyed sitting out on her porch for, for a little while together, and uh, uh, she is just doing fantastic. Um, we just want to uh, continue prayers for Judy uh, Fisher. She's been moved to the rehab side of Christ Hospital. Um, things are still one hour it's great, next hour not so great, and then next day good. And so it's kind of a roller coaster, but she's at least moved out of the cardiac wing into the rehab facility, so that's a good step uh, that way. So just continue uh, prayers for her. And um, um, uh, continued um, uh, prayers for the Rouse because Tim is retired. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's a joy and uh, a terror all in the same uh, vein, but uh, uh, Tim is determined to be retired and it is going to work. So blessings to Janice. <laughs> uh, for that. So, uh, continued. Of course, uh, uh, joy of Carlo's birthday um, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, you know, she's, uh, it is not easy being a pastor's wife and uh, so all of you um, uh, uh, just be appreciative for what she has to put up with. <laughs> so, uh, she is wonderful. So, with that, uh, but the, the hard um, um, news came this week for Jake and Carol. Carol lost her mom this week. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's one of those mixed blessings uh, at the time. It still hurts. Uh, uh, but the problem is, is it came at a time that Jake is on a fast downslide. And the family has been called together. Um, and uh, things are, are very grim uh, right now for Jake. Uh, so just be, just an absolute prayer for Carol. Um, this is just a, a, a wreck of a week for her. Um, and, you know, Andy and Jennifer and the rest of the family, uh, just continue to be in prayers for them. Um, you know, Jake is a, a blessed soul, and uh, this is a hard process for uh, a lot of people. Uh, so just please continue to remember Jake and Carol uh, in your prayers uh, uh, this week and in the moments and times to come. Um, so uh, that is just uh, in, in unfortunate. So, um, uh, Ruth, uh, the surgeries go all right for Mike and, and your son? Yeah. One, the surgery's doing okay, and we're in recovery. Um, and then um, um, uh, for the other, uh, just going through normal procedures and checks and biopsies, and hopefully everything is treatable and we'll be okay. So just continue. Hopefully we'll be okay. So just continue uh, for prayers for, for Ruth, both of her son-in-laws there. Uh, any others uh, today? Yes.
which affected her speech and communication. Um, she is rebounding from that, and everything is, as of right now, is being treated um, as best we can. But Dan is also in need of prayer, so he's trying to take care of mom, and he has um, macular degeneration in both eyes. So his vision has really gone downhill in the last year or so. Pardon me. But, um, yeah, they, they could really use your prayer. And prayers for Kim and Sandy as caretakers as well. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, um, as all of you have known, Glenn and Ruth are just uh, two wonderful people. And um, not that anybody is deserving of our prayers, uh, but uh, certainly a, a, a tough road for them and, and, uh, and a lot of hard decisions uh, to be made uh, by Sandy and Glenn and because we all know there comes a point where staying at home is no longer an option, and that is a hard, hard, hard decision. So uh, just be in prayers uh, for Glenn and Ruth and Kim and Sandy. Any others? Yes. We have a joy. Our youngest granddaughter graduated from UC next week, right? So Donna's youngest granddaughter is a UC graduate, and she will be working at Children's, you said? She'll be working at Children's Hospital uh, doing uh, radiology and imagery. So that is a great joy for them. Always good to see success uh, with that. So congratulations. Uh, to Donna and John Coleman's youngest granddaughter, and what a joy that is. Uh, any others? All right, let us be in a time of prayer, uh, then let us uh, come together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Gracious Lord, it is always a wonderful time that we can come together and pray together. Some of our circumstances are not always joyful, but the fact that we can come together and share them with one another to, to, to share the burden of what is going on in our lives uh, and take them to your feet uh, is a joy. Lord, we thank you that you are a gracious and loving God and that you do hear our prayers. Lord, uh, we just ask that your hand of work, of mercy and healing, uh, come together in the lives of our friends and our family. Lord, we ask that you lead us and guide us in a way that helps us to be a part of that process. Lord, give wisdom where wisdom is needed. Lord, uh, give uh, uh, strength where strength is needed. And Lord, give comfort, especially where comfort is needed. Uh, Lord, uh, we have many people facing very grim and serious situations. And Lord, uh, they especially need to see your light and to feel your love. Let us be a part of that in any way that we can. Lord, uh, we also thank you for the many glorious joys that occur in our lives. Let us be a people who are looking for joys and looking for your glory and looking for victory uh, because those victories are there and allow us to celebrate and give all glory and honor to you. Lord, as we come together as your people, we join in unison as we say the prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now hear the word of God. Our scripture readings today come from Isaiah and 1 John, starting with the Old Testament reading. Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 3. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. 
The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. Then from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now the ushers will come forward for the offering. you have commanded us to give to you out of our abundance. You have commanded us to give of our first fruits. Lord, may you be glorified and honored by what we have given today. Lord, let us be a people who no longer hold back from you. Let us be a people to realize that everything we have is yours. Lord, we thank you for uh, you allowing us to be stewards of the gifts that you have given to us. And Lord, we ask that your hand move upon these gifts that we are returning to you so that your kingdom may be expanded, so that other peoples may know of your glory, they may know of your Son, Jesus Christ, and they may know of your wonderful presence through the Holy Spirit. All of this we ask and pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you would remain standing, we will go to our next hymn. 
hymn number 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, verses 1, 2, and 4. Um, there was one prayer request that I forgot to mention. Uh, keep Anita Black in your uh, concerns. Uh, she was diagnosed with COVID this last week. She is doing okay. She went to the hospital and got different treatments, and uh, she's doing okay. It is not a pleasant experience, uh, but she is not in the hospital and, and uh, is uh, on the mend. So just continue to pray for Anita as well. Uh, this is week two of our sermon series about changing our focus. And uh, I am going through a, uh, a book study, and uh, it has a, a been a very compelling read. Uh, today we're going to talk a little about, about the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the story of the early church. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, Acts spends most of the first chapters focused primarily on Peter as he leads the other disciples through many of their early challenges. There is little doubt about Peter's impact on the early church, and the Roman Catholic Church considers Peter to be the first pope. Of the church. Later, the book of Acts makes a shift and becomes more focused on the missionary journeys of another big name in the early church, and that is the Apostle Paul. The writings of Paul are the largest surviving collection of writings in our New Testament. Paul's writings continue to be an incredible influence on the doctrine and theology of all major Christian denominations. But nestled in and out of various places of the book of Acts, we find another character who rarely gets much credit. And outside of the original disciples and the Apostle Paul, this person likely had the greatest influence on the early church, including its early growth, and its longevity. 
we first meet the character in the book of Acts, chapter 4, beginning in verse 32. It reads that at that time, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put them at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. A man named at birth as Joseph was first and foremost a devout Jew, said he was a Levite, the Levites were one of the 12 tribes of Israel. The tribe of Levi served particular religious duties for the Israelites and had political and educational responsibilities as well. The tribe of Levi had priestly duties as well as other duties in the temple. And the legacy of the tribe of Levi included being descendants of Moses and Aaron, who were both from the tribe of Levi. We also know that Joseph was not from what we consider to be the Holy Land. He was from the island of Cyprus. Cyprus is in the Mediterranean Sea, just to the west of the Holy Land. Cyprus was largely influenced by the Greeks and Romans. It was an important island and was a key location for trade throughout the empire. And unlike many of the original 12 disciples, this man named Joseph was a man of education and financial means. He was a landowner and was generous enough to sell one of his fields to help support the early church. But the most telling characteristic about Joseph was the nickname that was given to him. The scriptures tell us that the apostles called him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And in fact, for the rest of the book of Acts, he is only referred to as Barnabas. And in the writings of Paul, he is only referred to by his nickname, Barnabas, son of encouragement. Of encouragement. Now, I have been called by a lot of nicknames in my lifetime. Some of them have not been very flattering. Some were not so bad. In fifth grade, my teacher nicknamed me Dumpling. And when you're a fifth grade boy, being called Dumpling isn't exactly something you're proud of. It largely had to do with my physical appearance of being round, soft, and squishy. You can laugh, it's okay. In high school, I was often just called meek, which had little to do with my traits because I wasn't very meek. It was just a shortened version of my last name. In the army, one of my troops dubbed me with the nickname Corporal Cupcake. Now, this was a reference to a MASH episode of a heroic German shepherd who was named Corporal Cupcake. And the only reason I got the name, because I was the only corporal in the unit. So, I was Corporal Cupcake, and I was happy when I was promoted to sergeant and lost that nickname. In my home remodeling job, my coworker John and I are the Bert and Ernie of construction. And we have a lot of fun. Although my boss has also dubbed me with the nickname of Pigpen. And if you remember the character from the Peanuts cartoon, you remember Charlie Brown and the gang? 
He's that cartoon character where there's a whirl of dust always around him. I'm not exactly the neatest person while I'm working. If you look at all my work clothes, they're covered in paint and drywall mud and everything else. And when I had 30 plus employees, I know for a fact I had several nicknames that shall not be mentioned within these walls. Some of them have a little vulgarity attached to them. But in all of my life, I cannot say I ever had such an endearing nickname as the one given to Joseph of Cyprus, Barnabas, the son of encouragement, a well-deserved nickname as we will see time and time again. The Apostle Paul was originally known as Saul. Saul had a major conversion experience, and Saul became Paul. And in Acts 9, 19, after his uh, experience on the road to Damascus, it says, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among all those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And skipping to verse 26, it says, When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. You see, Saul used to hunt down Christians. He persecuted the church. He stood by and watched as many of them were stoned to death. Saul was a name feared by the early church. If you heard Saul was coming, you better get out of town because he was going to have you arrested and taken to the chief priests. The disciples were scared. The disciples were skeptical. How could this guy go from hunting them down to all of a sudden being a defender and a preacher of the gospel? This can't be right. It must be a trick. Hey, I'm one of you now. Give me your list of members, right? I'm one of you now. Who's going to believe me? And if it were up to the original disciples, the career of Paul as a preacher would have been very short-lived. Thank you very much. Go sit in the back row and shut up. Paul was getting beat up on both sides. The Jews hated him because now he was preaching for Jesus and doing a darn good job of it. And the Christians hated him because of his previous reputation. Could you imagine being Paul? He was so excited to have his conversion experience. He went face to face with Jesus Christ. He was blind and they laid hands on him and he could see again. And he wanted his fellow Jews to see this great gift, to say that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is here, has come true. Everything we've ever wanted is in Jesus Christ. And he was so excited. But his fellow Jews despised him. Not just because he was a Christian, but they saw him as a traitor. You see, because Paul was not one of those uneducated fishermen preaching a false gospel, because they could say, oh, those fishermen are talking again. But Paul was one of them. Paul was highly educated, Paul knew the scriptures, Paul was one of the religious elite and the jews are saying how can the guy saul who knows the scriptures like anybody else convert to the blasphemy of this christ thing and the jews despised him despised him but they didn't despise it as much as the early christians 
Now, Paul was the perfect example of what the gospel could do. Paul was saved. Paul was transformed. The Christians should be celebrating Paul. They should say, look what Jesus Christ can do in somebody's life. But instead of celebrating Paul, they rejected him. They feared him. They only looked at who he used to be. And here was Paul in the middle of all this hate. He has found Jesus Christ. He has found love. He has found grace. He has been forgiven, and nobody likes him. And in steps our man, Joseph. Verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. Barnabas the son of encouragement, stepped in. When everyone else was against Paul, Barnabas put his arm around him and he says, I've got your back. I see how God is using you and I am here to defend you all the way. And Barnabas' actions changed the course of church history because not only was Paul accepted by the disciples Paul's work and his missionary journeys and his teachings and his writings went on to shape the course of early church history and the scriptures go on to say in verse 28 so Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. And in verse 31 it says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Why? Because Barnabas was a grace hunter. He was a son of encouragement. And when the early church was divided, he brought them together. And he said, look what God can do through Paul. And people got over things. The divisions ended over Paul. And using his love and encouragement the church enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. It says they lived in fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Let me briefly tell you of two real-life Barnabases. Just a little over three years ago, I was told by our district superintendent that he had a new appointment for me. At the time, I had five years invested in my previous appointment. Now, that appointment was not easy at first. It was a divided church. But through the work of the Holy Spirit, we went from a congregation averaging less than 15 per week to averaging 45 to 60 people per week. Things were going very well at my previous appointment. And it wasn't easy to leave. There were many tears, including my own, over my departure. Now, in my first year here at Zion, I faced a lot of challenges. I will not go into detail. Some of you know some of them, but it's not here for gossip. But let me tell you, there were times... I wondered if coming here was a mistake. Because I felt I was preaching the right messages and doing the right things. But there were divisions in this church over various problems prior to my arrival. 
and problems that kept going on after my arrival. And there were people on different sides who were not happy with me because I didn't choose their side. There were people here who didn't like my style. There were people here who didn't like my content. And then on top of that, there were also problems put on to me by the district that made the problems here even more complicated and even more stressful. It was not a joyful transition. But there were two people who changed things for me. One of them was Glenn Ross. Glenn Ross would often give me that nod of encouragement. Walking past him as I'm going back to the aisle, he would give me one of those. And he grabbed my hand one day after service. He said, let's go have breakfast sometime, preacher. And we had several encouraging conversations over our breakfasts at the Cracker Barrel. He said, I've been through this. I've seen a lot of things in the church. Keep going. Keep doing. Keep preaching. The second Barnabas to me was another man named Joseph. Joseph, a.k.a. Jake Sullivan. Jake became the PPRC chair shortly after I came here. If you don't know what that is, the PPRC is the Pastor Parish Relations Committee. And everybody waved at Linda. Linda's our new PPRC chair. And the PPRC committee's job is to make sure there's a good relationship between the pastor and the people. And so if you got complaints, it's now her fault. <laughs> She's been on the job one day. Not today, not today. Give her a couple days. But I cannot begin to convey to you just how instrumental Jake was in helping me navigate many of the early conflicts. Many of the people who were adversaries in the beginning have become some of my biggest allies. Jake was able to, to provide the encouragement I needed to stick it out, to keep being the preacher that I was called to be. Jake was able to relieve some of the pressure that I was under. Jake helped to settle things down. And if you know Jake, you know he's good at that. He helped people let go of their frustration. He said, that's in the past. We need to let it go. We need to move on. We need to look forward. Because most of the frustration of the people here was caused by outside circumstances and their frustration had been redirected at me. And Jake helped me to remain confident in the direction that God was leading us. Jake had my back. Jake defended me. Jake helped others to see the good that I was doing. And Jake helped set the stage to allow healing to occur in this church. Jake helped set the stage to allow the spiritual growth that has occurred in some of the people here. And because of the Barnabases like Glenn and Jake, I grew as a pastor. And our church is in a better place today because of our Barnabases. In the book of Acts, there are several more stories of how Barnabas influenced the early church. In Acts 11, starting in verse 19, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also, 
telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. It says he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. See, the leaders of the early church were still trying to figure out the policies and the procedures of what it meant to be a Christian. See, there was no handbook. Jesus didn't leave them with a book of discipline saying, here's how you be a church. Here's what you do when people complain. Here's how you do communion. Here's how you do worship. Here's how you collect offering. Here's all the committees you need to have. He didn't have that. They didn't even have a New Testament because nobody had written anything down yet. They were going by memory. So what did Jesus say about that? No, what, oh man. But the disciples wanted to do things right. And one of their many arguments time and time again was what do we do with all of these non-Jews, all of these Gentiles, these Greeks, these Romans who want to become a believer? Do they have to become Jews to become a Christian? That was the question. That meant doing adult circumcisions. That meant forcing people to follow the strict Jewish diets and holidays and worship. And when the early church heard about these people in Antioch, a group of Gentile converts were running around unsupervised. Who are these people and what are they teaching? They got no disciple. There's no Peter. There's no John. There's no James. There's no Thomas. There's no Matthew. Who's in charge of these people? Somebody's got to do something before they get out of hand. So they said, ah, we'll send that old Levite. We'll send Barnabas. He'll go straighten out those young fools. Send him up there and he'll put some discipline into them. But you see, Barnabas didn't go up there to find out what they were doing wrong. Barnabas went there to find out what they're doing right. He didn't care if they had contemporary music. He didn't care if the pastor had ripped up jeans, crazy hair, tattoos, and piercings. When Barnabas arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, it says he was glad and encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Because it said he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. See, Barnabas was a grace hunter he didn't look for what was wrong he went and looked for what was right and in another story paul and barnabas had traveled a lot together on these missionary journeys and they had took a young and promising convert with them called john mark and something happened on one of those mission trips, and John Mark quit. He left. He abandoned them. I mean, they're out doing all this work. And this young whippersnapper who they brought along with them, who was supposed to do all the good work for them, stopped, dropped out, and quit. And whatever caused John Mark to drop out really made Paul angry. From Acts 15, 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him 
because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. This was not Paul's greatest moment. He said, we're not taking that kid with us. He already quit on us once, and I'm not taking a quitter. He left the job. He fell through. He's finished. I'm done with him, and we're not taking him. If you take him, I ain't going with you. And Paul and Barnabas, who were the Bert and Ernie, the team of mission teams, split. But see, Barnabas' grace redeemed John Mark. And you see, it was John Mark who wrote the gospel of Mark. The gospel of Mark is believed to be the first of the four gospels written. You see, most of what Matthew wrote and most of what Luke wrote was based on what Mark wrote. Now just imagine if Barnabas had not been a grace hunter. What if Barnabas had listened to Paul and had given up on this young man, John Mark? Nobody may have been the guy who started writing this stuff down. Without John Mark, we may be missing three of the four Gospels. Because he wrote all this stuff down and Matthew said, Oh, great idea. I got a few more stories I can add to that. And Luke said, wow, great idea. I have a few more stories I can add to that. You see, being a grace hunter means we seek to find the best in people. We seek to redeem people and help them become the very best they can be in Christ. Grace focuses not on what we have done wrong, but it focuses on what we are as redeemed people. We don't look at what was wrong. We look at what God is doing right, and we celebrate it, and we encourage it. and We want people to grow and move towards that way. You see, we are supposed to be a people of light. Earlier, Joan read us a lot of scriptures about being light. But all too often, we are a pessimistic group of people. And I'm just as guilty as the next person. I'm critical of how other people drive. All too often, I'm critical of my kids. I'm critical of things at work, especially when I go go fix what a bad carpenter did. I'm critical of things in this church. I'm critical of things in other churches. I'm critical of politics, not just in the church, but outside the church. And like many of you, I spend more time in my day seeing all that is wrong in this world. Anybody know any good things on the news? I've been trying to follow the Olympics because there's some good stories there. People who have overcome adversities. People who work their whole lives to reach the pinnacle. But the truth is, this is a dark and hard world. There isn't too much to cheer for, is there? 
Or is there? I mean, what about my kids who, despite their faults, are trying to be the best preacher's kids they can be? And Elliot's back there running the sound booth all by himself. It's hard to be the preacher's son. It's hard to be the coach's son. No matter what happens at work, I have the blessing of having a job and a paycheck. And what a blessing it is that through all the things this church has been through, there are many generous and faithful people in this church who give and give and give. They give their time, their money, their wisdom, and their skills. Many things to be joyful about. And what about the mega churches that seem to dwarf the small churches? We don't usually have a lot of good things to say about them. But why can't we celebrate their baptism? Why can't we celebrate and support their missions? They're doing it different, but they're doing it. And we can all agree the government isn't good at a lot of things. But there are many things that happen every day we can be joyful about. I'm joyful that I turn my faucet on every day and water comes out. I hate orange barrels, but at least the orange barrels mean somebody's working on trying to make something better. We have thousands of men and women in our military that are doing a great job. There are thousands who responded to the building collapse in Florida. There are hundreds or thousands of firefighters battling wildfires from California all the way into Canada. There are response teams who do great things in relief of tornadoes and hurricanes. You see, we need to become grace hunters. The world does enough to tear people down. Now who's going to build people up if we're not the ones who do it? Who's going to be the one to say, I've got your back? Who will encourage people to keep doing the right things? And who will encourage people to find Jesus or to grow in their faith? See, every time we saw growth in the early church, time and time again, it said there were people who were faithful, they were of one mind, they were joyful. And when all of that came together, the church grew. Because when they were in the mind of being a grace hunter, when they allowed the Holy Spirit to guide them instead of the pessimism of the world, the church grew. And if we want our church to grow, we need to model our lives after the Barnabases. See, Barnabas was first a devout Christian. Barnabas allowed the Holy Spirit to work through him. Barnabas was generous. Barnabas was excited. Barnabas was encouraging. And because of Barnabas, the church survived. Because of Barnabas, the Apostle Paul became one of the most prolific writers and influencers of our New Testament. Because of Barnabas, John Mark wrote the gospel. Because of Barnabas, the church grew and the church survived. And the question is, are you ready to be a grace hunter? Are you ready to be a Barnabas? Let us pray together. Wonderful and loving God, it is not an easy thing to be a Christian in our world. We live in a world of darkness. We live in a world of pessimism, skepticism. We live in a world that builds people up by tearing others down. We live in a world that wants to win by winning the argument. 
and we have fallen for the trappings of this world and all too often we are a grumbling, complaining group of people. Lord, allow us to change our focus from seeing all that is wrong and Lord, let us be a people that see all that is right. Let us celebrate what is right. Let us encourage what is right and let us be a part of making things right. Lord, I ask that you move upon the people of this church. Allow us to continue to grow in the direction that you have been leading us. Lord, I am ever grateful for what you have done and where you have taken us in the last three years. But Lord, your work is not done. And for us to continue this work and to grow this church and to make this church a pillar of the community again, we need to be people like Barnabas. We need to be people of love and encouragement. We need to be a people that go out and proclaim joyfully what your work and your handiwork has done through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, let us all be reflectful on how we act and how we react. And let us be bright and loving people that lead others to Christ. All of this we ask and pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 463. If you would please stand and turn in your hymnals. Number 463, we'll be doing verses 1, 4, and 5. Linda, you're going to thank me, right? Because we're all going to be grace hunters. <laughs> but let us be grace hunters. Let us seek and encourage all that is right with what we have. For we have a wonderful tool in this sanctuary, in this church, in this building. We have wonderful, loving, and gracious people we have a great organist. We have great worship leaders. We have people who are devoted. And let's build on that. And let's go out and show people what it means to be a grace hunter, to love God, to cherish what he has done for us, and to celebrate the glory of Jesus Christ, his forgiveness, his grace, and his redemption. Let us go and be a joyful people let us go in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.